worship team this morning. Wasn't that amazing? Before service, when they were practicing, someone uh, mentioned to me I was over in the Next Steps room, and they said, man, we are so fortunate to have uh, such a tremendous worship team and band, and I, I mean, I can't echo that enough. Each and every week, they are really ushering us into a place of the presence of God. They do it with such passion and excellence and uh, just absolutely amazing. Well, if I haven't had the opportunity to meet you before, I introduced myself just a second ago, but I'm Travis, I serve on the teaching team here at Victory Hill, and I just want to say welcome this morning. Thanks for being here, whether you're here in person or joining us online. We're so glad that you joined us today. You know, I was driving yesterday, I drove through the neighborhood, and I saw all these dogwoods in bloom, and it's just that time of year, right? Uh, Easter is upon us, just three weeks away, and uh, I, aren't you guys excited about Easter? I mean, <laughs> celebrating the resurrection of our Lord, and all that that has, the hope that is in Jesus, uh, being able to celebrate that, and Pastor Chad, on our vision night uh, this month, was just talking to us about the season that we're in, that it's time to uh, make room and that's exactly what we're doing you heard pastor mason talking about it on easter sunday going to three services on easter sunday to make room for all that god's doing he's doing such tremendous things right i mean 37th baptism i think we just completed this morning and i think we have one more in the next service making it number 38 god is moving and uh, we are in a season to make room for all that god is doing right here at victory hill uh, he's doing tremendous things around the world you can look and read and see that god is 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 absolutely moving but listen the three services doesn't stop on easter sunday we're going to continue to do that uh, beyond easter so that we can expand our reach and continue to serve more people here in our community so uh, exciting things you know my heart is just filled with anticipation about all that God is getting ready to do. Uh, just exciting to be part of that right here at Victory Hill Church. Well, I'm excited this morning to also uh, continue our series uh, that we started, which is Death Disrupted. Pastor Trey kicked that off last Sunday, talking about abolishing absolutes. As I was thinking about the message today, I, was, I remembered growing up as a child my dad was a coal miner, is what he uh, did most of my uh, young life, and, uh, you know, paid pretty good, but uh, it was pretty, pretty small outfits. It was strip mining, so it wasn't underground, but they would do strip mining, and when the coal would kind of, when they had mined all the coal in, the, in that particular area, uh, there would be a season where they would have to either pack up and move somewhere else, or maybe they didn't even have somewhere else to go. And so there would be a, a, a situation where they would have to have a layoff. And I remember my dad uh, losing his job and uh, not having that uh, regular income that we had come to rely on. And we would have to make cutbacks, right? It would have an impact on the family. Uh, some of you might be able to identify with this. Uh, you know, you go from drinking Dr. Pepper to drinking Dr. Thunder. Yeah, you know what I mean? So it's one of those situations where we have to scale back or we have to make adjustments. And it seemed like it always happened at the most inopportune times, uh, around the holiday or around vacation time when, you know, everybody else is getting to do things and all these things are happening and money needs to be more prevalent and it wasn't. Uh, I remember even people uh, coming alongside to uh, help us, right? To that they showed compassion to us. They had sympathy for us and that they would put money in a card or an envelope. I remember my mom opening those and uh, tears uh, running down her face because somebody had, I loved her enough to show that compassion to her and reach out in a moment where we felt a little bit hopeless about how things looked in our, in our life and in our situation. And, you know, today maybe you're here and, and you're not a Christian or maybe you're just exploring the faith. Can I tell you something? We're going to be talking about a story today that really is part of the, the human existence. Uh, it's a story that deals with grief and loss but has unexpected, uh, a story of unexpected hope and triumph over and hope in a situation that seemed dismal. So it was a, it's a story of unexpected hope. And I trust today that no matter where you are on your faith journey, there's something that, that unites us. 
We all are looking for renewal. We all are looking for a place of hope in moments of despair. And so uh, our goal today, or my goal today, is to hope, hopefully help you find answers to questions maybe that you're seeking, the questions that you're exploring today. And we're going to be going to... Um, Luke chapter 7, uh, verses 11 through 17. We're going to read that together. A little later, Jesus went to a city called Dain. His, <clears throat> his disciples and a great crowd traveled with him. As he approached the city gate, a dead man was being carried out. He was his mother's only son. She was a widow. A large crowd from the city was with her. And when he saw her... The Lord had compassion for her and said, don't cry. He stepped forward and touched the stretcher on which the dead man was being carried. Those carrying him stood still. Jesus said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. All struck, everyone praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. The title of today's message is Contagious Hope. We're going to be talking about contagious hope. Would you just pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we just come before you today, and uh, we're, we're just humbled to be uh, in your presence this morning. And I pray, God, that you would anoint me, Father, to speak your word with clarity, speak your word with boldness. And I pray, Father, that every heart and every ear, God, would be open to receive what you would have, what you would say to them today. In Jesus' name, amen. So verse 11 tells us that, it says, starts out a little later, Jesus uh, went to a city called Nain, and his disciples in a great crowd were with him. Let me give you a little context. So Jesus has launched his public ministry. Jesus was baptized earlier in Luke, and uh, he uh, was carried into the wilderness where he was tempted. He comes back under the spirit of the Lord, and he goes into the synagogue, and he opens uh, the scroll where the prophet Isaiah had written and had prophesied about the Messiah. And I want to just read to you what he opened the scroll and read in, in Luke chapter 4. If I, uh, It says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news. Uh, he has sent me to preach the good news to the poor and to proclaim the release of the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind to liberate the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Can I tell you, when he read that, he finished reading it, the Bible tells us that he sat down and he says that the scripture is fulfilled. In other words, Jesus says, here's my mission. I am the Messiah. Here's what I come to do. From that point forward, Jesus begins to heal the sick. He, he, raises, he, he uh, opens blinded eyes. He restores people. He, uh, uh, heal, he, he cleanses the leper. He forgives people. You see, Jesus is performing miracles, miracle after miracle. And as a result of that, a group of people has started to follow Jesus, to be interested in what he's doing and what he's, uh, what's going on uh, with him. And so he's I got this crowd of people. And in Luke chapter 7, uh, earlier in the scripture, we see that the centurion, uh, he heals the, the child, or not the child, but the servant of one of the centurions. And he does it because the centurion just had the faith to do it. And because the Serentarian's faith, Jesus said, your faith, I've never seen greater faith, and he, and he heals that particular servant. So Jesus is performing these miracles. He has called the 12 disciples, and a great crowd is following him. So right after he performs this miracle at Capernaum, that he travels it begins a tra he begins to uh, travel again, being on mission, and he comes to the city of Nain. Nain is about 25 miles south of Capernaum. Probably took them about a day to travel with that. So you can imagine, this crowd's following Jesus. Uh, he's performed all the miracles. They're fellowshipping with him. They're having a good time. There's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of joy as they enter this, uh, as they're walking with Jesus. But they see something as they come upon the city of Nain. The Bible says that they he sees a... Uh, a funeral procession that's taking place. Uh, and they, they see this, this crying and this, this sadness that's happened. And, and, and they were introduced to a couple of characters. Uh, the characters that were introduced to in this moment 
is a widow and the dead man or the young boy that's on a stretcher. And the widow, uh, what we have to understand this morning about a widow at those times, I want you to think about, she probably, when she was young, had these dreams and she had these hopes, right? Uh, one day I'm going to get married. One day I'm going to, uh, we're going to get married. We're going to live a long life. Uh, we're going to have us, a, uh, we're going to have a, a, a mud brick home. Uh, we're going to have a donkey. Uh, we're going to have 12 children and everything's going to be great. We're going to sit out under the stars. Uh, we're going to, together, uh, we're, we're going to be happy. Everything's going to be great, right? That's what she had in her mind. But we see that, they, that she is a widow, that she's lost her husband. And uh, she's kind of lost her hope in that moment because a widow uh, is kind of put in the same category as an orphan. And uh, when, a, when a person loses their husband, a widow in those times would be kind of relegated to living a marginalized, life, a marginalized existence. Uh, but fortunately, in this particular case, the, out of the marriage had come a son. Now, the Bible tells us that it was her only son uh, that she had. But what we see is the only son uh, would be the one that would take care of her, that he would provide for her in the absence of her husband that she has now lost. He would be the one that would step up and uh, provide for her financially. But as we see in this particular verse, it said that uh, she finds that he has now died and he is on a stretcher. And now, uh, you think about that. She probably had hopes and dreams for him, right? She was hopeful that, you know, he's going to have a great job, and he's going to be strong. He's going to have a family. He's going to give me grandkids. And, uh, you know, after her husband died, she knew that she had hope still. Even though her, she had lost her husband, she had hope that he was going to be able to take care of her. But now we find that he is on a stretcher, that he has also died. So the secondary dream that she has now is also gone. Everything seems shattered in her life and now she's she's beginning to realize that I'm probably going to be a beggar I've lost my, my not only have I lost this this guy this this my son that I love so much but now I've lost my financial hope by uh, what I'm going to be the future has been wrecked for me uh, because of this situation but the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 7, that he, uh, it says as he approached the city gate, he, the, the, he finds the son, the large crowd was with him, and it goes on in verse 13 and says this, and when he saw her, the Lord had compassion for her and said, don't cry. Now here's what I want you to notice. What the, what the crowd likely saw when they were coming up on it was they all saw the funeral. But what Jesus saw was the widow. He saw her, not just with the natural eyes, but he saw her. He knew all about her situation. You see, this was God in the flesh. This was Jesus Christ. It was our Savior. And he comes up on the scene of this widow. He sees her. He knows all the details about her. And the Bible says he had compassion on her. He had concern for her situation. He understood what she was going through. And it's, in having compassion for her, can you imagine what he does he he leaves the crowd that he's with the, the people that he's been fellowshipping with and he comes over to this widow woman and I can just picture it you know all the there's there's crying and there's mourning and there's grief in the funeral procession and and he Jesus comes along and he joins the procession and he begins to walk with this woman and can't you see it he just maybe he puts his arm around her maybe he puts his his hand on her shoulder and he tells her don't cry. In all tenderness and compassion and love, he comes and he surrounds her and he tells her not to cry. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. How would that sound if I come up to you when you're grieving and said, don't cry? It's probably not going to go over very well, right? Because she had every reason to be mourning and to be crying. This, this hope that she had had, the dreams had been shattered, and she finds herself in this place. Every reason to be mourning, every reason to be grieving, and here comes Jesus and tells her, not to cry. It made me think about, this is a crazy thing. It made me think about, you know, when I stump my toe or I hurt myself or I cut my finger, do you know what my wife wants to do right in that moment? She wants to know what's going on, what's wrong. And she's trying to help me. And I'm like, I don't want to talk to anybody, right? I mean, do have y'all ever experienced that? Like you, she wants to have a conversation and you're in the middle of pain. Here Jesus is coming up right in the middle of this pain and this grief. And he's telling her not to cry. You see, Jesus wasn't really just encouraging her in that moment to not weep or to, to have joy. He's really beginning to prophesy uh, 
about his power and give a foreshadow of what he's going to do. It's a foreshadow that the cause of her pain, he's getting ready to wipe it away. He's getting ready to take it away. It's even a foreshadow for his disciples all the way to Revelation chapter 21 where the Bible tells us it's at the, at, 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 when the kingdom of God is coming to earth and, and, and all of that's happening in Revelation at the end of the book. He says he's going to wipe the tears away from our eye and there's going to be no more mourning and there's going to be no more crying and there's going to be no more pain. You see, that's what Jesus comes to do. And right here in this moment, not as only as he's telling her just with his words don't cry, he's literally prophesying about his power, about his foreshadowing, about what he's getting ready to do. Can I tell you something this morning? That no matter what the depth of the need is, it does not diminish the compassion of our Savior. The depth of our need does not diminish the compassion of of our Savior. I know that this morning it's not just about this. I want to focus on just a moment the hopes and dreams of this woman, the hopes and dreams of this widow. Can I tell you, it's not just about the death. It's about the death of the hopes and dreams. You see, I believe there are people here this morning within the sound of my voice that you have hopes and you have dreams that God has given you and that we can identify with the widow of Nain when it seems like all is lost and and nothing seems to be happening like God has promised, like this thing that he birth or this thing that he's put on my heart this hope and this dream you see the bible tells us in acts chapter 2 it says that the young men are going to see visions and the old men are going to dream dreams the bible is full of dreamers from 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 moses to abraham to joseph and on and on and on the bible is full of god giving them dreams and giving them visions giving impregnating things in their heart can i tell you maybe for you that's a that's a family or a ministry uh that that god is that god has placed on your heart and yet it doesn't seem like like you're growing into that place or it's not happening for you or maybe it's your family. God's promised you this, this, this you have this vision of this beautiful family that serves God and yet uh, you've been through divorce or, or maybe you haven't found yet that, that, that helpmate for you that, that you can come alongside and walk with. Uh, maybe it's, maybe it's a, a situation where you desire to be generous and yet you're, you're dealing with debt and, and job loss and, and you can't get there or, or maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's just that that you don't have the job that you feel like is, is, you're able to find fulfillment in. Can I tell you something? The, all of those are dreams that we have that sometimes they seem like you look at them and, and they, they seem to be dead. They seem to be gone. I don't know. Can anybody identify with the widow of Nain this morning that, that dreams sometimes do not seem like they're going to come to pass? They seem like they're dead. It seems like all hope is lost in this moment and I don't know what I'm going to do. Can I tell you that, mo- that this moment of death uh, has taken over and it seems like everything continues to fall apart this funeral procession is is symbolic of the motion of death that it just seems like I can't break free from it it seems like it's overtaking me that's what the widow of Nain felt like she had lost her husband now she's lost her son she lost the people she loved but she'd lost her financial hope and now she's relegated to 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 this marginalized existence I don't know but I've been there I felt those things in my life when it seems like God is just left me and and I don't know what I'm going to do but can I tell you something the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ that no matter what our need is that he is able to do it if I could change that point just a little bit that would say the depth of your need the depth of our need is not too deep for God to show us compassion compassion that compassion is not diminished no matter what that thing is in Hebrews chapter 4 Go ahead, yeah. In Hebrews chapter 4, in Hebrews chapter 4, the Bible tells us that he can sympathize with our weakness. Jesus Christ knows. Just like he saw the widow of Nain, he sees us. He knows what we're going through. He knows what we're experiencing. He knows we feel hopeless because our dreams are not coming to fruition. He knows what's happening in our life, and they're not too big. They're not too messy for him to get right up in the middle of it all. You see, that's what our Jesus does. He wants to show us that compassion and that love. He comes around and we feel that, feel that in the middle of, of everything that's going on. He desires to show us compassion. Let's go on to see what he did. It says he stepped forward and touched the stretcher on which the dead man was being carried. Those carrying him stood still 
So right in the middle of this, he tells her not to cry, and then he goes up and he, uh, he, he touches the, the stretcher on which the dead man was laying, and the Bible says that everything stopped. You see, to touch the stretcher, would it was thought to make, uh, if you touch the body, the stretcher, that, that it would make you ceremonially unclean. Now, it's kind of ironic because I, I feel like that's maybe why things stopped in that moment. Jesus has touched the stretcher, and they're like, everything comes to a halt, right, in that moment. But he, Jesus, couldn't be made ceremonially, couldn't be made unclean. He's the one that makes the unclean clean. You see, so Jesus puts his hand on the stretcher and not only did the mourning and the crying, I can just imagine, everything just kind of stops. Everybody's like looking at Jesus. And then Jesus speaks in that moment and Jesus says to a young man, he begins to speak personally to the young man. And he says, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man set up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. You see, Jesus speaking personally to the young man, calling him out, and he says to him, he speaks with and demonstrates authority, right, in that moment. He speaks and demonstrates authority in that moment. Can I tell you something? Jesus stopped death in its tracks in that moment. He stopped it. Our Savior has the power to stop death right in its tracks. When he touches the, touches the, touches the stretcher, everything stops. St the, the motion of death is immediately stopped. But he didn't just stop death. He goes on to actually speak to the young man. The young man sets up. Even in the moment of death, the young man hears and responds to the voice of Jesus. And he sets up. And it says that Jesus then restores or he gives the young man back to his mother. So not only did Jesus stop in that moment, but he restored life. He stopped death in its tracks and he goes on and he restores life to that young man, even in the middle of death. In the middle of death, he heard Jesus speak and he responded to the voice of his Savior. He responded to Jesus. And then Jesus gives him back to his mother. So not only did life was restored to the young man, but it says, but basically hope was restored to the widow, right? In that very moment, all of the, the, the hopelessness she, she had had is now restored because the son is back to life, the one that she loved. And now he is able to provide for her and help her and walk with her and care for her and provide for her. So he's come back. So he is restored. Jesus has restored life and he has restored hope in that moment. Even in the middle of the motion of death that seems to be overwhelming and overtaking. I don't know about you, but I've been in those moments haven't you where it seems like it's dead and it seems like it's a hopeless situation but Joe 225 says this so I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten that the crawling locust the consuming locust and the chewing locust my great army which I sent among you now what I love about this is it it speaks to that motion of death because look, look what it says it says the swarming locust what the swarming locust didn't eat then the crawling locust ate what the crawling locust didn't get the consuming locust didn't get so it's like we've, we've got death and then we've got what more death and what that didn't take care of we got more death can i tell you this sounds just like john 10 10 the thief comes to steal to kill and to destroy he wants to he wants to bring death but jesus desires to do what bring life into the middle of a dead situation he desires to restore life he desires to restore hope even in these moments where we're experiencing those things philippians 1 6, 6 says this being confident of this, the, 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 the he who began a good work in you, the one that gave you the promise, the one that gave you the promise of a marriage, the one that gave you the promise of a ministry, the one that gave you the promise of children following God, the one that gave you the promise of children to, be, to begin with. Can I tell you something? He is faithful. If he started a work inside of you, the Bible says that he is faithful to bring it to complete 
salvation. Can I tell you, hope is not dead. I've come to tell you this morning that Jesus is here to stop the motion of death in your life, and he is here to restore life, and he is here to restore hope to you this morning. The dream is not lost. The dream is not dead. Jesus has to come to restore those things for you today. I don't know, but there are just those times in our life where we need Jesus to show up in the middle of death and begin to speak to our situation and bring hope. You see, the devil, the, the thief had come to bring death and he came to wreck everything in the woman's life. But Jesus came to bring life and he came to restore hope to her. He restored her dreams, gave her hope in the future, gave her hope for what he was going to be able to do in her life. And I want you to look at the result. Not only did he provide hope to her, but look what the next scripture says. He says, all struck, everyone praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us. They said, God has come to help his people. So not only did God show compassion on the, on the woman, on the widow, and not only did he stop death and restore life and restore hope to this woman, but it says that they all saw that there was a prophet. They all began to recognize that God has come to help us. In other words, the whole crowd, the mourners, the ones that were following Jesus, everyone began to experience and see the hope that was in Jesus. Now, did they realize in that moment that this was the Messiah? I don't know. Not for sure. They recognized him as a prophet. They recognized God was doing something in their midst, and they began to have hope. Can I tell you, hope is contagious. When God begins to move, and God begins to do things in your life, it will bring hope to you and your family, but others will see it, and they will gain hope. Hope is contagious when and Jesus begins to move in hopeless situations within our life. Here's the truth. The destructive nature of death is overthrown by the contagious power of hope. Do you hear me? The destructive nature of death is overthrown by the contagious power of hope. Hope had become contagious. Death that had consumed, that was meant to wreck, that was meant to take everything away. The things that, that the enemy's trying to do in your life to take it all away, to make you not hope, to make you not dream, to make you feel hopeless in this moment. Can I tell you something? God is saying to you, I've come to restore the life. I've come to restore hope. And as he does that, it's going to bring hope to others. The destructive nature of death is overthrown by contagious hope. It's overthrown by Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you, you've never experienced this hope that I'm talking about. Can I tell you, you're kind of like, before we encounter Jesus, before we meet Jesus, do you know we're, we're like the dead man on the stretcher? We're like the guy that's laying there that, that, that has no life. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, I want you to read this with me. It's on the screen for you. It says, however, God is who is rich in mercy, he brought to us life with Christ while we were dead as a result of those things that we did wrong. If he, if he did this because of the great love that he has for us, you are saved by God's grace. We are made alive in Jesus. We're the dead man on the stretcher. And Jesus is, is, is we, we are... The Bible says we are dead in our sins and our transgressions, that we're living the life that we want to live. We're enjoying the pleasures of this life, and yet we lack the fulfillment of any of it. We keep searching and we keep looking, but there's this emptiness in inside. There's this hopelessness that, that we're experiencing, and, and we're, that, we're that guy. And, and then Jesus shows up, and, and Jesus speaks to the to the, to, the, to the dead man lying on the stretcher, and he says, young man, get up. You see, Jesus comes, and Jesus is the one that brings life, that makes us alive through what he did on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection is because he loved us. Jesus came, and he's now here this morning. Can you, can you just hear him calling your name this morning we're like the we're, we're dead in our sins and transgressions but Jesus is calling to you he's whispering to you and he's saying to you to get up to come into life 
come into life. I've come to offer you life. I've come to bring that to you. I've come to bring you the hope. I've come to, to give you a hope, to give you a future. Being dead in our sins and our transgressions and being made alive when Jesus came to the scene of the stretcher, he brings life to the young man. Jesus is the one that brings life to us today. John chapter 5 says this, I assure you that whoever hears my word and believes in the one who sent me has eternal life and won't come under the judgment, but has passed from death unto life. You see, how do we get the hope that we're talking about? How do, we, how do we get the contagious hope that defeats death, that overthrows those feelings of emptiness, the feelings of destruction, the feelings that I can never do what I want to do. I can never have the thing. My life can, can never be put back together. Can I tell you something? It's Jesus. It's saying that I believe in what you did for me. I believe that you showed up just for me. I can hear his voice even in the middle of death. Even in this moment, can you hear Jesus speaking to you and calling you from the life of sin and death into a moment of life, into a place of life, into a place of fulfillment? You see, the Bible tells us if we believe in him, if we believe in God, the one who sent Jesus, we believe that he died on a cross and we believe that he rose again on the third day. We believe that he did it for us. We confess it with our mouth. The Bible says that we are saved and that we pass from death to life. Jesus has compassion on you. He has compassion. He stops death. He can stop this this morning. This is your moment. Can I tell you something? The city of Nain, small town, small rural community. It wouldn't be thought that Jesus had any reason to go to Nain. But it was a providential moment. It was the right time. He was in the right place to perform a miracle. If he'd come too early, he would have probably missed the funeral. If he'd come too late, he would have probably already been buried. Jesus came just at the right time to show compassion, to stop death, and ultimately provide hope that stopped the destruction of death. That's what he desires to do for you this morning. He desires to provide you hope. He desires to destroy death that's operating in your life and give you life and life eternal. Would you just bow your heads with me this morning? If that's you today and you say, I can hear the voice of the Lord speaking. I hear him calling my name. Would you just lift your hand? I just want to pray with you this morning. There's nobody looking around. Nobody sees those. See that hand. Thank you. Listen, if you know what to pray this morning, you can pray. If not, I'm going to lead you in a prayer that just uh, nothing special. It's directly from Scripture. It's just acknowledging that we want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of our life. Would you just pray with me? Lord Jesus, I hear your voice calling me to respond in faith. Today, I come to you as a sinner, dead in my transgressions, in need of your grace and forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins and rose again, conquering death. I surrender my life to you and ask for your forgiveness. Help me to follow your voice, to walk in your ways, and to fulfill your mission in my life. 
I confess with my mouth that I am born again and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Thank you for your love and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.